But the reason why um, Monday is actually on Wednesday, Wednesday this time are the AirHacks in Munich. So I'm back from uh, from two-day workshop testing in microservices and announcement. There were some sick attendees and they want to attend uh, later this year. So uh, today I um, introduced the uh, testing and deployment. So it will be going to be in December the 16th. Okay. and. Um, and uh, during the microservices workshop, I just mentioned briefly that I'm building a new server. And I got um, several emails from the entities who would, would like to see the part list. So I prepared something. So I introduced um, a new point in our uh, question and answers show. So uh, welcome to the 28th edition of um, AirHex TV. So um, we will start with um, Java EE news, um, as always. And um, so the breaking news is um, the register. This is the uh, website. Um, um, obviously, um, interviewed Oracle, and uh, Oracle said that uh, Oracle is committed to Java and Java E. And this is um, also interesting here. There's a spokesman from Oracle, Mike Müller, said Oracle is committed to Java and has very well defined proposal for the next version of the Java E specification, um, Java E8 that will support developers as they seek to build new applications that are designed into using microservices, which I'm already doing with Java 7, but in Java 8 seems to be um, even better, uh, on large-scale uh, distributed computing and container-based environments on the cloud. And Oracle is working closely with the key partners in the Java community. So um, I didn't met this partner, so I was really interested who actually the partners are. So um, I asked around, but no, was, no one is informed. What's also interesting, um, Java E8 is supposed to be developed in the Java community process, and there is um, no, no real movement right now. So I'm really interested what happens. So it seems like Oracle works internally on Java 8 and then will commit everything at once at Java 1 uh, with announcement. Um, so it was like the back to the old Sundays where um, Java 1 was really exciting because we got uh, uh, breaking news at Java 1. So these are actually breaking news. This is one week old. OK, so this is uh, somehow Java related. Um, also what happened, so there is a nice website called uh, MicroProfile.io. Um, or it was, at least. So what's wrong with the website? Here is it. And um, there were actually London Java community group. This is a Web Liberty profile, so IBM, Red Hat, Tommy Tribe, and Payara. And what they did, they say, okay, let's define a minimalistic, um, a very lean um, a micro profile, so a Java EE 7 or 8 micro profile, uh, or profile for microservices. And, um, and this is actually, in my eyes, um, a nice move because community sees that something actually happens. There's lots of discussion, so if you're interested, um, join uh, join join the group and participate in the discussion. So um, what happened so far? Um, so we committed to uh, Red Hat uh, to Red Hat to JaxRS to uh, JaxRS uh, CDI and JSON P. And this will be the minimal set of, um, of specs. And uh, then the community will decide will, what will come to, um, to, to 1 1. So this is the first version. And um, even things like startup time or deployment size or runtime size may be defined in the subsequent versions. And this was actually announced at the um, DevNation. So I will just put it to the chat here. Oh, we have already uh, lots of um, uh, lots of um, attendees again from all over the world. So if you if you like, just uh, write to the chat from which country you are. So last time it was all over the world. So it's always fun to see from which country the people participate. Okay, this was, was micro profile, and I wrote a uh, short blog post. And um, if you if you would uh, start the uh, screencast here, um, I actually. Let's see whether it will break down or not. Ah, the live event was ended, <laughs> so it doesn't work anymore. But it was, uh, you have to find it, this was the uh, th uh, the uh, 36 uh, minute of the live event, and there was actually the introduction of the DevNation conference. And um, yeah, this was uh, the really interesting news. And then 
go further with with minutes. So there was an executive meeting, um, JCP meeting in May actually, and many people participated. And what's interesting here, they also mentioned the Oracle's Java E inactivity. And this is the future of Java E. And this is an um, interesting uh, piece. So I will also uh, copy to the chat. Oh, Victoria, Canada, someone. So. And what um, there's a Martin is a well known uh, uh, speaker and uh, luminary from the uh, London Java Community Group. And they said, um, OK, we are really concerned about uh, the future of Java E. And the problem which I don't not fully understand is like Oracle has the IP in the GSRs and therefore it is hard to assign another spec lead. But there is a formal process in JCP to, to take over an inactive spec. So it would be actually interesting to try it. So if uh, a spec is inactive and someone would like to improve it, in my eyes it would be a way more productive to just try to take it over and then uh, 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 put the changes, then wait until something happens. But um, but the uh, the conclusion of this meeting was then that they will uh, they will contact um, Oracle management and uh, and then discuss what actually should happen in the future. So it seems like uh, the actual IP is the problem, not the um, uh, so intellectual property, and not actually the inactivity. Um, so I get lots of questions about what is my opinion about uh, you know Java E8 coming late, and the opinion is very similar to let's say um, I will have to I will write a blog post about this um, didn't it, uh, time so far but uh, similar opinion to you know if iPhone 7 will come late so in, in my eyes is uh, iPhone 6 or any other smartphone is already perfect and good enough. And uh, if iPhone 7 will uh, you know, come later or whatever, then will come later. It's not like it's a huge uh, revolution. It's the same will happen with Java 8. So uh, in my eyes, Java 7 is already perfectly usable and very productive. So I I'm, I'm, I'm really like it. And if Java 8 will come later, then it will come later. It's like um, I'm not really waiting you know, for all the new features. Uh, there will be some JSON binding. Um, hopefully monitoring will come out. But without this feature, we will be still incredibly productive. Um, the problem is the, um, the, the the marketing or community perspective, in my eyes. If nothing happens, uh, new developers might think, OK, Java E is dead or whatever, and then we just uh, ignore it. Th this is the real issue, not that it will actually come late. But I'm really happy, oh, happy. I'm really curious what uh, happens at uh, Java 1 and how the announcement would look like. And um, yeah, whether they just say, look, this is Java 8 without JCP or what is going on. This is yeah, really interesting. So um, at the at the last um, air hacks, the 27 air hacks, I got a question about remote and local interface, and I wrote a blog post to uh, to explain why I think remote uh, interfaces have to be considered as deprecated in, 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 uh, and not used anymore. And um, and the what points down is actually whatever we are doing right now, whatever we are creating are wars. So there are no more. Ears actually, and never as a legacy projects are using ears, but the new project are worse. And the endpoint from war is usually REST because it's required anyway for for HTML5 and uh, and other uh, services. So there is um, and uh, remote is based on RMI over AOP and on serialization. So it introduces unnecessary risks. And therefore, uh, don't use remote. If you don't use remote, you, only, uh, you also don't need uh, local anymore. So uh, forget uh, EGB interfaces. Just go with a single class. And um, this is actually the blog post. And I will just put it to the show notes as well. OK. So also interesting, or interesting, um, there was some uh, Twitter discussion. It should be, um, oh, we have Twitter here. Let's see. Oh, this was Jose Moreno. He approached me and asked me about uh, microservice middle view runtime and so forth. And um, he got me the idea because um, it is um, harder to explain. So what I did, I recorded a screencast and showed him the screencasts. And uh, what he's asking, what is actually the the, uh, the 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 size of the thing? Wait a second. Where is is there someone the Moreno? No. 
and I recorded a screencast uh, to explain it and what it boils down to uh, to explain what is the actual hard disk size of a Java e microservice. So to explain you this, uh, let's see what the Docker is running. It runs, so I have some, some Docker containers running from yesterday, so from a microservice workshop. And let's pink one, uh, let's say uh, this one is, the, so what we can do, let's say, oh, let's take this one. So I could say Docker history and put this one and you see exactly how big the image is. So what you can see is 200 megs is the operating system and some uh, and and uh, I installed some additional utilities as another 200 megs. Then uh, the Whitefly is 140 megs and uh, the unzipped Whitefly is 160 megs. So this could be deleted, of course, but I just ignore it because um, hard disks are really cheap. So this could be actually deleted afterwards, but I don't care why I will see in second. Then uh, three kilobyte is um, configuration file and uh, there is a startup script is another 11K and now comes the interesting part. As you can see, this didn't change for months or weeks and this is the upper layer in Whitefly. So what it basically means, this never changes. So regardless how big this is, and in this case around uh, uh, 700k minus this one, so just uh, I was just too lazy, no one cares about this. So let's say a 700 megabyte is the, as a size of a single um, application server image, but the cool story is it will only remain or only resides once on a single machine. So regardless how many Whitefly microservices I will start, this only is um, resides one on the machine, once on the machine. And what actually changes is the war. So there was an, a deployment, a war deployment during the workshop. As you can see, there are 10K. So if I would um, uh, create, you know, 10 or sorry, 100 images a day, there will be 100 um, um, multiplied by 10K would be around one meg uh, image size per day, not to know 100 times 700 MB. So what it actually means is, Java EE is a really interesting platform for microservices because it comes with natural separation between, uh, between infrastructure and application code. So there are no fed jars or fed wars. It's actually an anti-pattern. So what we do in all my projects, we strictly separate the infrastructure from the business logic. Therefore, wars are, 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 are tiny and the deployment, time, uh, deployment times really fast. So um, that's a quick hack. So if we go here to Docklands, and now build a new image. Uh, so this is the build time of, of this image. So if we just, uh, let's say, so no, nothing changed. So this, this um, image still resides here, but I built a white flag pink and um, this was the time to create it. I would um, just deactivate the cache. So let's do this so we could actually, Deactivate the cache, so you will see, we just copy this without cache, and you will see the worst possible, no cache. So there is no caching involved, it's still very, very fast. So if I would build, you know, the whole 700 max, it will be never complete in 100 milliseconds. Okay, this was drama of the week. You know, I got lots of conversation, uh, lots of conversation like, um, is, is Java E appropriate because the, the the image size is so big, and the truth is there is only uh, there is only one image per application server version, and uh, therefore it, no one cares about the size. So none of my clients ask me, you know, that we should reduce the uh, hard disk space of uh, hard disk space of application servers. Okay, so this was the. Um, the Docker image size screencast. Um, this was my server. I think we are done with Java EE news. Not not yet. I got an interesting question from uh, on on a blog about uh, BCE, and he asked me, "Okay, uh, this um, he had a, a nice a nice nice question, and he asked me, you know, we have a post and comments." Uh, how to how to organize them in, in with boundary control entity 
And my answer was um, start with the posts and just add the comments to the post component. But you have watched carefully whether or not you know the comments becomes um, more uh, more uh, how it's called. Uh, whether the comments will dominate the post component, then you will have to extract it to uh, to a component called uh, called comments. So um, at the beginning, I actually don't care. I put everything in one component, but I watch closely what actually happens. And in the process of learning of the business logic, I split the components then into into independent packages. Perfect. So I think we covered the news and drama. And now uh, go uh, with the server. So uh, I got lots of questions about the server. So it seems like hardware is uh, is interesting again. So uh, instead of I, I would I would show you how you choose the hardware. So first I always start with the CPU. And there is an um, Intel page called arcintel.com. And um, I actually not not started with this pro uh, CPU. This is actually a lo longer story. I started with I think this one. Yeah. So what I wanted to do, all my CPUs and my server actually, um, they are, they use um, the um, low power Xeons, and the low power Xeons are not as fast as the as the uh, um, high power Xeons. And uh, what I wanted to do is, you know, um, to create one machine just for my tests, not as servers, or just to play with. So like, you know, uh, start lots of Docker containers or whatever. Right now, all my machines are reasonable, so they consume the least amount of power. And uh, this is where my block and the whole infrastructure is running. So the idea was to create, you know, uh, to buy a new Skylake uh, Xeon and create a machine around it. So wh what 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 I did? I, I, I first I tried to find out, you know, what actually Skylake means in Xeon, and it turned out uh, these uh, V5 processors are Skylake. And I tried to find uh, a reasonable one, and this is uh, almost the fastest one. I think there's one faster, but was not available. So I bought the machine, and um, the most important thing is the socket here. So having the socket, I tried to find the uh, the board, and I always use the super micro uh, boards. Uh, notice the, the the wait a second. Notice the um, the, um, the the price of the processor was 400, 400 euros. So now we have with the board, and this is a pretty expensive one. And this is server board or workstation board for super micro. And I always use these boards because they were server grade or workstation grade boards. So um, this board is uh, is um, uh, works with works with uh, Xeons, the current Xeon, Xeons with the socket, and uh, it comes with an interesting think it is called PCIe port uh, which can be used for storage and therefore I have two servers right now let's uh, show you why so this was my choice and then I bought the, um, not this then I bought that so okay this is interesting so let's buy a really crazy fast SSD and this is not the regular S8 uh, um, uh, SSD this is actually the PCIe crazy fast uh, PCIe card and what I found out that this card and the current Xeon and my memory actually consume less memory than my current server. Then I revised the decision and say, okay, so then I need two machines. And um, what I did then is, okay, I need first a Xeon, low power Xeon. So I decided to, uh, for the, this, as you can see, L is for low power, 2.9 gigahertz. And low power means 45 watts. The other one was twice as much. And, and uh, since it runs, you know, 24-7, um, it makes a difference. And as you can see, it is around 300 euros. So it is surprisingly cheap for, for a Xeon. In year 2000, I bought, you know, two core Xeon and have to pay 2,500 euro, I think, um, which was, you know, uh, five times as, as much as, as now. So, and then, of course, I say, okay, then I new, uh, uh, need a new chassis. So I bought this one, which is beautiful. And I always uh, buy the biggest possible tower because there is no problem with the room. And the larger the tower, the easier to maintain. And, you know, you can build a new, new, um, new ventilation, and uh, you can play with it. So it's always ATX port and uh, never server because I'm not building a cloud. I uh, I have I think uh, three or four servers, so there's no problem with the towers, and they're really convenient to maintain. So and then the next idea was okay. Then I need a board with two PCIe cards um, in order to make it rate compliant. So um, this is the board. It's actually a gamer board. It will arrive tomorrow, 200 euros still. 
and um, and uh, d there is room for two PCIe cards. And I look it up, and um, you can run them in RAID for reliability. So the new server is going to be low power Xeon with a gamer board and two PCIe cards and 64 gigabyte of RAM. Um, actually, uh, the RAM is Samsung uh, RAM. So if you go, let's say, Super Micro, and the board is uh, X11 SAE, I think. Exactly. So what you have to do then, there is a certified memory list, tested memory list, and you get the vendor. And I bought uh, the ECC RAM, which is the which is the uh, most expensive one. I think this one. Yeah, and I bought the Samsung, and 64 gig were around 400 euro. So long story short, I think the whole server cost me around 1,500 euros. Um, and um, it will be considerably faster than the current one and it will consume less memory which is incredible because on this machine what i will uh, do with the other one so i will have two servers low power one and, and higher power one and what the machine will do um, i will use it for uh, for performance tests and and just to uh, start microservices docker swarm and stuff stuff like this so this is about the server so the gigabyte board the ssd and uh, the chassis, which is beautiful. So, and of course, where is it? So, some pictures. So, um, what I this is the this is the RAM. This is uh, almost built. And what's interesting here, this is a Noctua um, uh, cooler, and with a huge um, uh, vent. And it is very, very. It, it works. It worked for years. So not this one, but the old one, without any issue. So this is uh, important to monitor the, um, yeah, to have a, uh, to run it cool. And you see here, here is the PCIe card. Um, so this is um, how it looks like. Uh, this is the old chassis, and the problem why I need a new one because I have a large uh, um, power supply, and it's no more. It is no more uh, compatible with this one. And um, what else? What a second. Was it all? This one. What is it? Well, for pictures. Yeah, exactly. Looks nice. And um, yeah. So and what I usually do, I have uh, two or three power supplies, and I just test what what consumes uh, less memory and uh, less memory, less power, and then I, I put them in production. So lots of fun. And um, yeah, I, actually, more and more clients ask me about this, and uh, so uh, smaller companies build their own server. So it's not uh, that you know that crazy. And um, if you think about this, my my servers get cheaper and cheaper, and more and more powerful. So in my eyes, um, private clouds might become more and more interesting, because the only issue is a power. If you could run on the server now OpenShift or whatever or whatever cloud-like software to manage your applications, there will be no difference between the real cloud and your private cloud. And uh, I think um, actually more and more of my clients uh, think about uh, their own, you know, uh, using the servers again in-house or on-premise. Okay, um, I'm pretty alone with the opinion because I know the. Analysts uh, thinking the, um, the, the the public cloud is the big future, but I think hybrid approach might work. Uh, so let's see. So Oracle says it's committed to Java E. This was the the register micro profi profile announcement. We had it, and then interesting one. So I will just switch to the gist. Um, is uh, this question, what are your thoughts about Wi-Fi Swarm for microservices? And what I did, so um, I just compared Payara Micro with Payara. So Payara Micro is like Wi-Fi Swarm. So if you look at this, 60 max. The Payara Full, not web profile, absolute full profile, is 120, so it's twice as much size. What you think about this is 60 megabyte. So I actually forgot what the price of the PCIe card was, was around, I think, 200 or 300 euros. And um, I bought 512 megs, which is actually weight at 512 gigs, which is actually not required. But what I will do, I will, it, it is called over provision them. So I will just form a 25, six gigs um, for, for longer reliability. But even in this case, I think um, my current server has 127 gigs or 256 gigs available. And um, because of Docker, 
I just uh, I think I have the 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 hard disk is almost uh, almost empty. So I really none of my clients and also not me we don't have a problem where we need a more hard disk space. And if you think about this, the Payara Micro or Whitefly Swarm uh, are designed this way that you package your application server with the app. So what this would mean is. You know, um, the <laughs> the upper layer would be the biggest, and all other layers would be tiny, tiny or even not existing in in the worst possible case. So, um, and the question is, this is just why to do this. So, wh why to you know create the whole server on each commit, for instance? This is what we actually do in my Java projects. You have a Jenkins pipeline. Each commit creates an you know, a new deployable image. Now, if I would use Fed jars or Fed wars, the um, the, the images would be would be huge and 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 if, if cl my clients would ask me why you are doing this there would be actually no answer and um, all my clients so far and there are actually uh, more and more clients with this approach are really happy with docker in java e because of the separation another issue with uh, whitefly with whitefly not with uh, with whitefly swarm uh, whitefly swarm is the following so they have a generator which is uh, interesting. What this basically means is you can pick and choose your dependencies, but then your server or your runtime becomes a unique snowflake. So um, I think a huge advantage of full profile Java E is, um, you know, all application servers are very similar. Even Glassfish is similar to Whitefly because they share wealth and um, bean validation, for instance. And um, so what it what it basically means if you get if you have a problem in your project and you go to Stack Overflow, is very likely you find the answers. But now imagine I build you know my custom uh, server with my custom configuration. There are some class loading problems. Um, I would say the chances are very low that someone else in the community has exactly the same configuration, and then I'm pretty alone with my snowflake. So therefore, I actually never use it. And but. What I have to say is, all my projects are enterprise projects. If I would build a cloud, or uh, I would be a Facebook, Twitter, or whatever, Netflix, then I would probably revise my decision because then, you know, I could cre create my unique um, microservice, save a few megabytes, or um, yeah, a couple of big megabytes. Um, and then if I run my microservice, what uh, um, uh, what uh, what will happen then? Uh, then I could run it uh, several hundred times, actually several thousand times in in the case of Netflix, and then it's a considerable amount of RAM which can be saved and money to be saved. So usually my project we have 10 to 20 uh, processes, or if you would like um, microservices. So whether we save, you know. 200 max or not, no one cares about this. You, you saw how cheap actually the hardware is. Okay. I think we covered the first question. So. I got a question from Anonymous and he allowed me to, to, uh, to, um, to mention this without mentioning the name. So Java E status, um, he said, during my studies, I utilized Java E6 for cre creating distributed systems to monitor IT infrastructure. So, and then concern expressed information of Java E that you are part of. And what I wanted to say, I'm not a part of Java E Guardians. And the reason for this is not because I don't like them. I have absolutely no time to participate. And I actually told Riza, uh, uh, I'm really sorry, I won't participate in your mailing list because it will kill me. So if I get uh, more emails, so and the whole story of AHX TV is that I don't answer the technical emails anymore. But if I would uh, get uh, Guardians emails instead, and, you know, there's, uh, I have no interest to create a Guardians TV. <laughs> so um, I, I'm not participated here. Uh, what what I watch closely is the technical Java uh, side, but but not the Guardians. But I think that they do uh, they do a great work, and um, I like Riza and and all the participants. So I'm just uh, watching them and try to help them whenever possible. Um, so, so the, he asked me whether Java is worth pursuing in long term, and um, there, actually, in my eyes, there is no Java E, right? So Java E is like the umbrella spec, and uh, the question is: is, is Hibernate, CDI, Weld, uh, JMS, and w whatever pursuing in long term? I think so because I mean, there are there are lots of projects out there, and if you have deep Java E knowledge. 
you you won't have any problem you know to to migrate your knowledge to some to something else and there are lots of books and resources in the internet and even if java e would die in the next two uh, two years i don't think the next big thing will be that different to java e okay then he asked me about jack Torres and restlets and so forth um So, and he said, okay, there is a full stack engineer, it's simply market of a specialist. And he says, okay, we have um, backend, but in front end, you have to use Angular and JS libraries, and they are uh, changing a lot. And this is actually what happens in my projects. So, what actually happens, we, we stop with the REST services and expose the REST services to everyone, or we use JSF uh, in startups mostly, and uh, plus REST services. So, um, so and, and then, Another team or the same team can use Angular, what we, what we use more and more, React, for instance, a nice small library, React to access the backend services. And uh, this is like it is. And uh, for, for the native development, uh, we use Electron, JavaFX, um, stuff like this. Um, so, and this is actually, this the last sentence is, uh, last sentence is important. So actually the backend is absolutely reusable. Okay. Java and JavaScript. Uh, in my project, I always use statically typed languages. Um, yeah, and um, what is uh, what is my advice to JavaScript? So actually, um, I use JavaScript in parallel with Java in the beginning. So, but at the beginning of I don't know 1995, 1996, um, you should keep secret that you have uh, JavaScript knowledge because it was considered like a toy language or uh, even worse than Visual Basic. And um, and what's my opinion? I have to say, I actually like it. So I like the ECMAScript 5. I actually even performed some workshops at Munich Airport about JavaScript last year and this year. And why I like that? Because it was so different. So it was completely different and therefore it was interesting. And ECMAScript 6 ECMAScript 6 is uh, very like Java. So it reminds me really in Java and, and you can write programs with it, of course. And um, I have to say I enjoy JavaScript. Of course, it's not type safe, but you can do uh, uh, this. Actually, because it's not type safe, you approach it differently, and you have different set of uh, best practices. And with uh, TypeScript and um, with minimal effort, you get um, pretty good code completion with uh, Visual Studio Safe from Microsoft, for instance. And um, yeah, so I would say learn JavaScript, and with JavaScript and Java. Um, I would say you have, let's say, how was Programming Language Index? I forgot actually the name of the TOB. Wow. Java is number one. I will, yeah, you will see tomorrow a blog about this. <laughs> Java is number one and JavaScript is number seven. So I would, I, I thought JavaScript is number two, but still, with Java and JavaScript, you are well set. I, I, I would not learn PHP because it <laughs> comes prior to JavaScript. So I would say learn JavaScript and Java and, and you are well set. And um, yeah. Then, Golang. So Go language, I like it. What's also interesting is, um, is Swift from Apple. It's, it can also be used on, on, uh, on server side. And someone, ask me uh, during the air hacks, what is my opinion about Swift on the server? And back then it was not um, supported on the server, but I have to say, say Swift becomes more and more interesting because there is a huge company, Apple behind and lots of developers. So it is as interesting as Golang to me. So, and there was also an email, internal email. So internal, someone uh, wrote email about my opinion, fork join in Java E8. They are right now not compatible, but if you use, for instance, completable future. So uh, watch the microservices workshop for me. So I, I do it actually. So what I do, I use completable future with managed executor service, not with the fork join. But if you use parallel streams, they are currently using the uh, fork join framework, which is not Java E8 compatible. So right now, uh, if you are using uh, parallel streams, you should be careful in a Java E environment. Okay. So we covered a couple of questions. And uh, now see, let's cover some Twitter questions. So about monitoring, uh, someone asked me, uh, no, someone, this is uh, Costa. Is it possible to use, uh, to 
is it possible is it possible to use whitefly in the same way you use glassfish lightfish if not can you talk about this i can talk about this is absolutely possible and actually uh, someone from red hat wouldn't wanted to port uh, lightfish to to red hat so it would be absolutely possible and i just lost my browser here is it and um there is an actually a project hocular hocular whitefly and the uh, hocular project is monitoring project and this is somehow si similar to to lightfish for it uh, for for whitefly so you can ex absolutely use it and uh, read the blog there that there is actually well described what to do how to integrate hocular with with uh, whitefly okay so we killed the tabs which is a good thing so twitter said Oh, please don't write too too long uh, questions because it's really hard to um, to <laughs> to read it to, to the attendees. Um, so someone is from Saloniki, Germany, of course, and um, and USA. So Brett Tucker is USA. So I'm curious how how late is in the US. And and Brett Tucker attended EAHX. Um, as a so uh, thank you for this in Munich. So he came the all way, way around from from US. So, so Nino asked me, may you write a book of BCE since you get so many questions about this? So actually, what I have to say is, so I use BCE in a customer project as well. And the whole documentation was usually around, I don't know, two pages. And everyone satisfied with the explanation. And I also wrote a chapter in the green book about this. And in project, there are no questions left. It seems like uh, my blog is not good enough. So if I, I probably a post will be enough. I cannot imagine that I, I will be able to write a book about BCE. This book would be, I don't know, five pages long. So if you like something like this, I could try it. But um, a screencast, so I had even screencast recorded. So yeah, and the questions about BCE is not the questions about BCE. So questions more how to organize um, business logic in, in Java packages. Okay. Um, or have a look at Uncle Bob's talk about this. And I think the Uncle Bob um, has a di different opinion that I have about BCE. I, I just misuse the boundary control entity names uh, for my projects because uh, before this I had my own names and this was disaster because in all projects I have to you know to justify my naming since I uh, take the B boundary control entity naming no one uh, no one tries to rename the pattern so this is actually my social hack to avoid meetings <laughs> so um sensor okay there is Okay, I think now we cover. So what what is actually? So um, if you have time for uh, okay, my team is has trouble managing and sharing Glassfish configurations for our projects. When a dev developer join us, one of usually spends one to three hours. Wow, helping him get set up with JNDI entries, server libs, XML configuration files, and so forth. So um, it would be really nice to reduce this setup configuration to five minutes. Do you have any advice? Okay, so what do you need? Stopwatch. Then, where is my terminal? This is actually from the blue book, so it's not a customer project or something. So, create X-ray domain. It's a little bit dangerous. So, what it does, it deletes a Glassfish domain and recreates the domain from scratch. It should take less then then five minutes so now it starts the domain and it's available so five minutes is way too long so i would never accept five minutes so it was five three eight five three eight zero and it's fully configured payara or glassfish domain so uh, what i used here Just as admin, as you can see, I just deleted the domain, created the domain, started the domain, created some JVM options, connection pools, and GDBC resource. So for each resource is one liner. So this is the first thing you can do. In real world right now, I do something else. 
So um, I'm using uh, Docker and each project gets an own, for instance, here Payara configured and Docker image. And here you have the AS admin uh, uh, commandos. And what happens then, uh, this runs once, then I get a pre-configured server and there is nothing to do. So if I uh, would, for instance, inherit from this, I think the Payara, where is it? Uh, Payara pink inherits from Payara configured. So if you have a new project, you only will have to inherit from this and this is basically set. So you know, you should aim to one minute setup or, uh, or zero seconds setup with Docker. And why it took one minute, around one minute in my case, because Glassfish generates SSL certificates and this takes longer time. So, uh, someone asked me, do you use Docker for local development? No, I'm not using, I could use it, but I'm happy with local server. Okay, I have it. Okay, now... Next question. How to control the life cycle of stateless EGBs? So, impossible. Actually, I'm, I'm injecting some services with producers and in case the configuration change, changes, I want EGBs with the new configuration only. So, the issue is um, instances are, are cached or pulled. So, if someone injects uh, something to EGB, uh, it's the injection uh, um, is static, so it, it happens once per instance and, uh, and is never changed again. You could use the instance, so you could do something like add inject instance of string uh, message and this is static and then go and say message get I think and this is done in the method hello something like this the issue is you might end up uh, uh, getting memory leaks because the uh, oh, uh, because because uh, each fetched message will remain in the in the scope of the instance. So what is better with EGBs, if you would just inject the configurator and ask, and this is your class, and the configurator then is able to return to return the instance. The configurator could be application scope, request scope, or or or, or whatever. And this is like a proxy, which then will fetch from the database, whatever you like. Okay. And this is a nice one. So the question is, uh, there is a, an application. So uh, the uh, Musa um, says, I'm implementing an e-commerce application with Java 7, Glassfish 7, and so forth. And the problem was you expired. And the question is how to deal with that. How to handle. And it is actually defined in the uh, servlet spec. And the, the thing you are searching for is the error page. So what you will have to do is you should to put in the web XML page and I'm um, sorry, web XML not page in the scriptor, a tag error page. And this error page tag can uh, can then redirect to a uh, to error page or, or to login page. So um, what it actually means if the view expires? If the view expires, usually means you um, there is a. It really depends on the uh, implementation, but there's least recently used al algorithm. So, uh, af or either the session expires, or uh, there is no more room for the for all the states of the GSF. So it could expire. So this is if you push you know back and forth, uh, b uh, back and forward buttons, and this is actually configurable in uh, Mohara. There is this a parameter where you can configure how many pages are saved. So how to handle this um, in WebXML? And uh, what we also did in in projects is there is I actually even show this in prime faces for instance. There is an inactivity. Uh, yeah, detect inactivity. It's, it's like inactivity monitor, I think. Monitor. 
in prime phases idle monitor so and what it does is if nothing happens wait a second you see no activity what you are doing here, over here if i do something welcome back and after five seconds just comes so what you could do you can you could proactively actually see whether the user is active or not active reload the page or redirect the user to the to the login page this would be a, a nice experience it's actually what what some banks are doing for instance in the okay i have a big monolithic java e application on whitefly so and uh and the question is how to deal with clients so what he does there is it produces application scope client and this also application scope so there's one client shared by or by all other clients so i actually never did this what i usually do i use stateless session bean the client is created in post construct and the web target as well so they are cached per ejb and even in worst possible case i get 30 you know cached clients if i get really 30 parallel requests but they are cached and um, I, I actually always pro perform stress tests and there was never a problem with it so uh, my advice would be you know try the try first the worst possible case if you will change this to request scoped each request will create a new client perform a, a really stupid stress test with for instance apache, apache benchmark look with jvisual vm how your application behaves then change to the most uh, most efficient solution this is yours and and see what happens then and compare the results i would uh, i'm already thinking i don't think there will be a no uh, a huge difference and instead of application scope i will use um, egbs for this okay now let's say i have a web app on glassfish 4 which logs here in web app how can i serve this log file in the browser so um first if you have glassfish what you can do is actually whitefly running or glassfish you don't have to serve this because you have access to the log files from from the console and from the uh, rest interface already this is actually what Lightf lightfish also does it um, so we have here the server and we have here the logs so you get the logs directly and what you also get um so directly you get the logs in the browser what you can also do you can fetch the fetch the logs using uh, curl or as admin command so and uh, if this is not enough what you can take a look at connectors adam bean so this was actually example from the green book and this connector is able to uh, to to uh, to serve a file and you can configure you know to read the file from uh from from the glassfish folder or whatever but i wouldn't do this this is way too complicated just uh just use the um the the, the, the glassfish uh, facility to do this okay i hope it's answered if not if not you can of course uh, use uh, you no know, um, a simple uh jacks res resource which just access the file directly and returns that so so java on autobahn <laughs> nice overuse of cdi bad smell uh so what he says is everything is a cdi bean and they have to use uh, cdi because the architects decided ejbs are too heavyweight which is funny because uh ejb versus cdi github what actually happened um, monsieur samolisov watched my screencast about um, this is effective java in the screencast in the workshop effective java e um this is ahex io workshop and what he uh, and what I did, I compared the performance with EGB and CDI, and turned out, of course, EGBs are faster because of pooling. And what he did, it compared uh, Spring with EGB and CDI, and it turned out the EGBs are the fastest technology <laughs> so far, which is which is funny because I know project which migrated away from EGB to be more efficient. So and it seems like your oh, your architects have similar. Uh, concerns so wait a second where are guest github oh guest github adam bean i think adam bean just lost exactly and 
Can we make it a little bit bigger? And this is this one. Okay. So and um, and is it overused? Uh, yes. So what I usually do, but this is just my way of um, of, of of implementing the stuff. Um, in BCE, I have one EGB with stateless annotation, and anything else doesn't do not have any annotations. No EGBs, no CDI, nothing. So everything is depending dependent scope and it works fine. So um, what it basically means. So if you would get to go to let's say I'm not log in. Adam Bean headlands. So for instance, this is one of my projects. And let's say we go to here the cache boundary. So uh, we have the cache resource and this is the entry point and anything else would be injected. But here is just too simple. There's not even injection. So let's see. Uh, probably Lightfish itself. So someone asked me about uh, Lightfish. This is the Lightfish backend. Boundary. And um, we have applications resource with injecting application monitoring. So we go to application monitoring. And this is an EGB, which is uh, which just comes with that. And then I inject EGB statistics collector. And this is uh, uh, EGB statistic collector is probably uh, a control. And this is nothing. So there's not even EGB, no CDI, nothing. So um, this is the typical architecture and in open source and actually all other projects like boundary is the entry point and everything else is um, are just POJOs. In fact, the POJOs are actually CDI managed beans, but I don't need annotations for this. And we use the scope annotations and you know, our request scope, application scopes, whatever. For if we build UIs like JSF, then it's needed on, on the server. I never use scopes actually or rarely use scopes. Sometimes uh, if EGBs are not needed, I, I use from time to time application scope, for instance. I think um, Porcupine project, um, so it, everything was CDI, so I try to avoid to use EGBs just, you know, to for startup purposes, I use application scope um, as startup bean. Okay, so I think this is a code smell. So I'm so this is interesting. So uh, Julio Roja code road, com. Ha, said okay. They had problem with um, EGB's singleton. It gets status four fifteen unsupported media type, and this works for me. So what I did, I created a small project singleton resource, which is singleton. And if I go here, and just go to the singleton, I got it works. So this seems to work. So I can, uh, whether it's this EGB singleton or not, doesn't matter. What does not work, interestingly, is this. So if this sub-resource returns a list, even if I wrap it with generic list, a generic entity, I still get the error. So, and this is actually interesting. And the error is the message body writer not found for media type and so forth. So what I would do, I will report the error to Payara. So uh, seems like a bug. Uh, I'm using a lot of sub resources. I didn't bump to the, the error because I tried. So I, I rarely use this because I have to admit in, in recent projects, we fully rely on JSON arrays and JSON objects. So um, there was, I didn't use it for a long time. So such something like this. And yeah, so you will have to check it. Uh, it would be interesting if this is a list of uh, Jack's B objects, you will still get the error. And um, yeah, to go to Payara at GitHub and please report the issue. And uh, yeah, uh, they are very active. So um, if you if yeah if you go to the uh, Payara guys on GitHub, you you will see they are, they, they never sleep. They commit uh, day and night. So they work all around the clock. Seems like okay. So this question covered. And there was some. Uh, Oh, there's also an uh, alumni from, from Airhex, and he participated a session in Java user group Nürnberg. And um, I, I mentioned something about logging. And he says, OK, um, if, if a request goes through five different microservices, how I implement logging in that case? 
So, and uh, what you could do, of course, if you have a uh, header, cookie, JWT token or whatever, you can use it as a flow ID and each microservice could use, for instance, log stash or, or, or just log directly to Cassandra or a NoSQL database or SQL database and then you get, you know, the your flow and uh, yeah, but I have to say it is unusual. I cannot remember the word we ever invoke five microservices in a row. Usually there are just you no know, two microservices, but never five. So this is what we did so far. And centralized logging services are always a good idea. Why? Because in microservices, I always use Docker. If you would log to a Docker image and you will remove, remove the Docker image, the, the log files will disappear. And um, with Logstash comes, comes with nice tools like Kibana. So you get a really nice view with that. And um, so um, what I also mentioned probably at the Java user group in Nuremberg, um, what I, if there is no requirement for, for locking, I just uh, uh, gather whatever, whatever interests me in, uh, in a singleton or in a store and expose it via REST. So there, is no, there are no log files somewhere, so, but I can access the state of the application in real time using uh, HTTP. Okay, next question. And um, so in this question, he asked me what. Um, so how do you monitor the time elapsed during the execution of a method? So um, let's say um, we would like to monitor uh, boundaries, controls, whatever. You could use the Java Simon or Java Mon um, or, or what you will do. So actually what I did recently, I implemented for a client a uh, interceptor which uh, gathers the, uh, the the monitoring data and sends via CDI event to a singleton, which gathers the data and exposes. I even, I think, implemented something like this in the um, effective Java E online workshop. Um, so um, this is what I would do. And uh, I would, um, because uh, as you probably already know me, I, I if, if something is easy, I always will prefer you know, the simplest possible solution. In this particular case, I know that it's very simple to implement uh, the performance monitoring. Also, what I would do in this case, I would catch the exceptions, create an, an event which uh, contains the method with the exceptions. And this event could be, could be gathered by, the, uh, by, the, by a singleton and then expose via REST. And what you get then is you can ask the system, you know, show me methods uh, which recently threw exception or which method through which exceptions and uh, how often. So this is actually added value you get easily get just by, you know, putting everything to a simple hash map. And with, um, with Java 8 and streams, it's very easy to create your own report. So this would be really a nice, nice hack. As you say, this is uh, 11 lines. Yeah. So questions regarding BCE. This is from uh, kgampe5. Um, so uh, boundaries and entry point, yes. Uh, CDI seems to be the tool to put everything together and building the application structure. Yes, yeah, or EGBs, so I, yeah. Any status to the boundaries prevents them to be processed by CDI extensions. Probably true, yeah, you are right. Uh, but I have to say uh, the last time I used CDI extension is to implement my own scope for Vardin. So this, for example, makes it possible to add interceptors programmed by CDI extension stateless objects. Um, I'm not sure because EGBs are technically a CDI objects, uh, CDI managed beans as well. So uh, technically it should work actually. And this is a thing is big disadvantage of the BCE pattern because the boundary plays a central role in the pattern and so forth. What is your opinion about that? Uh, whether I have solution. So if you really would like to have CDI extension and you could convince me that this is you will save a considerable amount of time with your CDI extension. What you could do, of course, replace stateless with transactional request scoped or transactional scoped. So um, transaction scoped. And then this is, your, this is the solution. Or, or should, ah, Java 6, or should it work and do I make some kind of missing or conceptual faults? So again, if, if you really have to have used the CDI extensions, which I really, this is an absolute exception to my projects, then replace stateless with request scope, measure the performance. It will be a little bit slower, 10 to 20% slower. But uh, uh, I mean, we are talking about milliseconds, not seconds here. Okay. And by the way, 
I implemented something like this in uh, oh uh, who needs aspects I think who needs aspects Java magazine article Java magazine oh so I put in the show notes in this article I implemented CDI extension which re uh, which um, reacted to naming conventions. Okay, so, and the last question. Could you comment on this presentation? Three hours ago, so I had no chance to, to read the presentation. Nine nines, whoever it is, or whatever it is. Points from the presentation. Java helps building distributed monolith. I don't even know what it means. Actually, um, yesterday in the microservice workshop at Munich Airport, what I started is with one slide, don't distribute. So if you can, you know, stick with a monolith and uh, microservices are workaround so if a monolithic is too, monolith is too big or you have to put you know more more people on the problem uh, then think about microservices if if not just deploy a monolith this is my personal opinion so and and i don't even know what distributed monolith means because my this my if i built a monolith it was never distributed and th there is no help from java either so actually yeah okay Java has a threading model that isn't, isn't ideal for microservices. Actually, it is. So, so what we did yesterday, so we um, used uh, asynchronous JAX-RS processing with, uh, with Java concurrency, and, and it worked really well with a little bit. So I also don't know what it means. And the threading model is actually very good in Java. Why? Because what you can do is it's very, imp very simple to implement throttling. And uh, if you're interested in this, just 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 watch the um, microservices online workshop, uh, for instance. So where I measured the um, where I try, you know, to break the server and um, connect it with J Visual VM, and uh, and try to uh, uh, to to explain what actually happens behind the scenes. And um, actually, the application servers Glassfish v2 or v3 was the first server with NIO and uh, great support for co Comet and, and non-blocking IO. So um, I really don't know what it means. Java doesn't support the notion of data, of the notion of data in motion streams. Uh, what it probably means is reactive programming. So a little bit it does. It's also what we did yesterday with uh, completable futures. But I have to say, none of my clients ask me about data in motion. So if you ask me such things, is really uh, what is uh, you ask me? Uh, what is my opinion if you have nothing to do in Malaysia? Or what is my opinion if I'm in commercial projects? So in commercial projects, there's no such issue. In my leisure, probably I would look at something more exciting like Java E. But right now I have no time for this because I'm yeah, uh, lots of projects going on. Java e doesn't support resiliency. So what resiliency actually means is like uh, robustness, and uh, so what we did yesterday, we implemented. Uh, uh, circuit breaker, um, circuit breaker, breaker, bulkheads, and uh, and actually all patterns we found was a few lines of code, without any third-party libraries. We stock Java E and Java 8, and there were no questions left. And we had about I would say around 30 attendees from all over the world, and I really challenged them with questions. And uh, at the end, it just worked. So uh, the four, I'm pretty sure it it cannot be true. Uh, yeah. Java is implemented as containers. Yeah, we have web container, AGB containers. This is true logically, but at the end, you get full profile application server. No service elasticity. Actually, what I demonstrated yesterday, and this is. So you see here HA proxy, and uh, what we did yesterday, we actually discussed elasticity. Uh, hands on. So what happened behind the scenes, I performed a uh, stress test and then I killed one server, then started a new servers and we discussed elasticity a lot. Uh, but there, and Java is, and even if you would look on commercial, uh, without Docker, just look at uh, the, the recent WebLogic server, they even implement a multi-tenancy where the server itself can be partitioned. Um, yeah. No notion of immutability. This might be true, but this is, probably criticism on Java itself, not Java E. I mean, 
what is immutable in Java. Java is just API and, and Java, it's, yeah. So this is what I, I think is out of scope. Cho choose choice of data stores. This is somehow true that is, uh, Java is more about JPA, but uh, having that said, if you look at data nucleus, for instance, nucleus.org. So there's a, uh, with JPA, you can access um, Cassandra, HBase, Neo4j, uh, Excel, or JSON, or whatever. And if you look at, uh, I think it's called Morphia, right? Morphia. Even uh, Morphia looks very like. Hmm. Should be an example. Here's the documentation. The Morphia looks very like JPA. So, and then you have entities and this is uh, mongodb and by the way there was a java one meeting i would say two java ones ago where uh, the spec leads from jpa this was Lynn and the michael and the others asked the audience you know what we can do to improve you know the nosql support and and it was really hard to find anything so um no outer architecture while still calling it a platform this is what i know i don't know what it actually means and java it doesn't know services yeah, but we all, what we if we build uh, JaxOS resources, we call them services. The question is probably, yeah, this is like a, the REST API is service API. And, and what I, <laughs> probably, Java does not support SOAP very well because we remove it. This is probably what could be meant. Okay. So this is already, uh, this is already covered. So I would just reload this. No questions. So those are the most recent questions. I was not very well prepared about this, so I have no time to to look at the slides or video. But this uh, is something going strange is going on here, and um, so let's look here. So uh, so um, yeah, um, uh, the Mr. Vamara have to s wait until it's available on YouTube. It will be available soon. Could you briefly comment on my last paragraph? Overuse CDI is a bell smell. Yes, it is. I mean, overuse of everything is uh, is uh, is uh, is a uh, code smell or bad smell. I mean, just imagine. Yeah, you get new new developer on your team, right? And the new developer is uh, um, uh, right um, after the school or university, and then the developer, you know, uh, sees. 200 annotations with one hello world method. It's just not necessary. So um, I would say in my boundary control entry, or my, uh, with this approach, you get one annotation on the entry point at stateless. Or if you don't like stateless, you can do transaction scope or put uh, several annotations on it. Um, and everything else is just POJO. So it's a way simpler. And if you can achieve something in a simpler way, whatever you do in a more complex way, in my eyes, is always a code smell or bad smell. Uh, maybe you have any advice or recommendation on how to become a good Java freelancer. <laughs> a good Java freelancer. Um, uh, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, uh, good Java freelancer. You have to like programming and really like Java. And then if you are old enough, uh, old enough, if you are, you have spent um, uh, time in projects, then, um, then you will see whether it worked out for you or not. Um, but a good Java freelancer would means good Java freelancer. So actually, I'm not only of, of I'm I'm a freelancer, but um, I I'm working as a you know consulting. I, I'm I'm programming. So um, I think tr try several things at the same time. This is what I will advise you. And um, yeah. So uh, Ola asked me, what is the difference between parallel stream and EGBS in Kronos or compatible future without giving a MES? So parallel stream uses fork join. At asynchronous uses internal uh, pool, so I'm just here in this question. And completely future without MES uses fork join pool as well. And what's the problem? This fork join threads um, are globally configurable, 
Uh, MES is uh, managed executor service can be configured per Threadpool. Um, also, if you're interested, look at look at uh, Porcupine. And uh, this is the, the basic difference is on application server, you can specify multiple thread pools. I also call them bulkheads. This is one of the microservice patterns. And um, and uh, with frog join, you have a global settings for, for the whole application server. So it's not as fine-grained. And these threads are not managed. So you, you, you have a, can go into issues with transactions. Okay. So um, thank you for watching. It was a longer show, but there are lots of questions this time. And yeah, uh, thank you. And if you like, um, join in December. There will be no short, sh no um, workshops in Munich before December because of workload. So this is the price of being a freelancer. <laughs> no time for workshops. And but uh, see you next month, the first month of the month. Um, this is in two weeks this time, or two three weeks. Thank you for watching. Thank you for great questions. And thank you everyone from Germany, Canada, USA, and whatever. So thank you and bye.